I would like to emphasize that the little funny curly brackets that that you see here are a very important aspect of this of this language okay and it's important to understand that lingua franca is not a programming language it's really a coordination language it's not meant to replace your programming language so uh, there's the notion of a target language and the target language is a conventional language. So what you've seen so far is the use of C as a target language, where the code generator generates a standalone C program. We currently have four other targets, one of which is still very much in development, but uh, C++, uh, Python, TypeScript, and Rust. The, uh, the Rust one is a little less complete at this point, but I'd like to introduce next uh, Christian Menard, who is a PhD student working uh, with uh, Jeronimo Castrillon at the Technical University of uh, Dresden. Uh, so Jeronimo holds the chair for compiler construction in Dresden, and he has a really hotshot uh, group of uh, students working with him, and we've been very lucky to be working with several of them. Um, Christian was the first to fully engage with this project and has been very instrumental in the development of the language. And he single-handedly built the C++ target, which has a number of features that he'd like to show you now. So Christian, take it away. Hello, everyone. So yeah, um, I want to show you a simple example of um, a C++ program in Lingua Franca. And uh, I will quickly walk you through this. So uh, the first difference is, of course, that we set a different target. So we say uh, C++ here in order to generate C++ code out of the program. And then what we embed in all the directions is actually C++ code. But also the code that we generate from the Lingua Franca program is C++ code. And we can have a look at this uh, in a bit. And of course, we also utilize um, the language features that C++ uh, provides compared to C. So uh, we have classes, we have templates, and actually vectors become translated to classes in, in C++. And we can also utilize templates. So I did a modification to um, this, um, to this kind of vector that we saw earlier in C. And I made it generic yeah, by adding this, uh, this little T here. This is a feature of Lingo Franca. And this gets translated uh, to a template in C. And then we can count any uh, value. We could make this an 8 bit integer. We could make this along. We could also use some type that implements the increment operator. So, um, this reactor actually does the very same as we've seen earlier for the C version. It's a, uh, made it a little bit more complicated. So for instance, we can actually define methods. Uh, so since this becomes a class, we can extend it by arbitrary methods and then facilitate code reuse. And we can call this actually from a reaction. And also state variables, they become member variables of the class. So we can actually directly reference them same, same as for parameters. So we can directly access count and stride and operate on those. Also ports become objects. So that we can set on them. It's not the macro like I can see. And then we can send this count out. And the same for input ports as we will see in a second. But before we do this, I quickly want to show you um, the, the generated code. This is the header file that's generated for this reactor. And it's a class. Uh, it's templated because of the generic T parameter. And then it has a bunch of things in it, uh, like the timer uh, and other things, like defines reactions, defines the ports here on the bottom, also constructors created. And actually, what I said earlier is it's not quite true. So it's not a single class that's generated, but actually two. There's an outer one and an inner one. And that inner one is actually the scope that you see as a programmer when you when you write reactions. So in here, reaction bodies get defined, also the parameters get defined, state variables. And basically, this is everything that you that you see that you can reference from a certain reactions. Also methods. So the leak method is defined here. 
All right. So I extended uh, this count and burnt example that we have seen earlier by a rector that I put in the middle here. It's the hello rector. And what it does is it uh, takes as an input a T um, and it produces a hello message of type T, uh, with, with it's quantified by T. And this hello message is a type that, that we defined ourselves. For this, we can use um, the preamble. That's like a prefix that is inserted at the top of the program. And we define the struct here that is just um, a value of type T and a string um, that, that identifies some message. And in order, so this is basically to show that you can also send more complex types than just integers, right? And um, in order to highlight how this works a bit in, in C++, I made this a little bit more complicated here than necessary. So actually, all of the um, values that you send via ports in the C++ target are um, smart pointers, the so reference counting pointers. And uh, this allows you to ensure that there are not any data races in the program. So in order to create such a, a smart pointer, very similar to what the standard library provides here, there's this make mutable value function, and it creates um, a pointer to a hello message T. And then we can modify that. So we um, assign the message here, which is given by a parameter, by the way. And we also assign a value, which we got from our input. And we retrieve the value by calling get on the input. And this will also return a smart pointer. Hence, we have to also dereference that to actually obtain the, the actual value. And we copy that then to our new message. And when we complete, uh, completed operating on this on, on the data object, we can send it out. And actually, we have to use move semantics here. So um, we use the C++ move operator to move the ownership um, of this object, of this value, out to another actor and to actually send it to somewhere else. Afterwards, uh, the reference we got will be invalid. And this really ensures that um, once some other rector operates on that, it's guaranteed that there are no other references, especially not mutable references to that value, so that there could be data races or something. Um, all of this usually you don't have to do by hand. So there's uh, this most of the time works implicitly. It works implicitly in the case for very to send a simple integer. And also for more complex types, you can just create them directly and there will be automatic effect in these smart pointers. But sometimes it's quite useful to do it this way. And uh, finally, we got the print reactor. This is very similar to the print reactor we had seen before in C. It only uses a slightly different method of printing, um, printing the data. And also in this case, it's not just printing hello, it's printing the message that, sent, that it receives from the hello rector, which by default is also hello. All right, so um, let's run this quickly. Let me clear this first. And when we run this, it's doing precisely the same as the C example that we've seen before. Um, it's saying hello every second and it's showing the count that is incremented by 10 every time. Um, now, there's another interesting feature that I would like to show you, um, namely that C++ is a bit more flexible, more dynamic in its runtime, and it doesn't need to know so many static uh, things when it's compiled. And this um, is also used to make uh, the, the application configurable. Um, so actually, I have uh, define several parameters on the main reactor here. And these translate to command line parameters that I can use to configure the program. And in this case, I can slightly modify the behavior of the program, but I can also do very complex things with that. Uh, so for instance, I have here a version where I set the stride to two. I want to have a period of 100 milliseconds and the message to be full. 
I can fire that up and then it more rapidly produces uh, data and it finds always true at the current count. And I can actually use this to also uh, change the architecture of the whole program as we will see later. That's it for me. Great. Thanks, uh, Christian. Again, that's uh, Christian Menard uh, working in at the Technical University of uh, Dresden. So um, one of the things that uh, I particularly like about this is uh, the, the generated C++ code here is really quite beautiful to read. It's really quite a notable contrast with the C code, which is uh, rather hard to make beautiful. Um, okay, so next I would like to introduce uh, Sarush Bateni, and Sarush is a PhD student at uh, the University of Texas at Dallas, and he's working with Professor Kong Liu, and, and Kong and his group are, are top experts in real-time systems, and so he brings a, 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 a different angle on the project. Uh, and he has contributed an enormous amount. One of the things he did was uh, he single-handedly created the Python target, um, which has a huge advantage of being able to pull in the whole ecosystem of Python into your uh, lingua franca applications. So if I could turn it over to Sarush, it's all yours. Uh, thank you, Edward, for the warm introduction. Um, okay, so I have um, opened before me um, the Python, Python version of the Hello World example that you've seen. Um, and that, of course, is designated using this target Python. And if you look inside these funny brackets, uh, which are definitions of reactions, part of the definition of reactions, you, you will see Python code which in this case, you can see the print, uh, ubiquitous uh, print function. Um, okay, so the first thing to note about the Python target is you might have already noticed, but the parameters, state variables, and ports don't have types anymore. And that's because the Python target follows the Python philosophy of dog typing, which is if something works like a dog, and quacks like a dog, it's a dot. Um, and in this case, both um, counter and printer expect um, integers. And so what happens here is, um, and you can see this in this body of the, uh, in the body of this reaction, um, that what is sent on the output port is a state variable count that is initialized to zero which is just an integer. And the receiver will just print it without uh, needing to explicitly mention types. The other thing that you might have noticed is that similar to the C++ target, uh, the output port is an object. So then here we're calling a set method on this object to set values on the port. So um, if I save this program, you might notice on the right on the uh, console. And if you're using LFC, you will see that this in the terminal. But once the code generator is finished with generating the Python code, it will give you instructions on how to run the program. And, and it's uh, very simple. So there is a Python 3, which you need for executing any Python code. And this generated tutorial.py which is generated code for, from this .lf program. So if I copy paste this, you will see that it will, be uh, it will execute it just like uh, other targets. So just to look at, um, for a second inside that tutorial.py, if you look at it, you will see that what has happened here is for each reactor that was defined in the .lf file, you will end up with um, a Python class. And then if you have state variables and parameters, they will be uh, members of this class. And your reaction functions will uh, be methods of this class. The other thing about the Python target is that it's built uh, based on the C runtime to enable maximum efficiency. 
And if uh, I scroll down, after the reactor classes are instantiated, there is the main function, which calls this start, which is a magical function that will fire up the C runtime. And the C runtime will take it from there. So it will be in charge of handling events, executing reactions, and so on. OK, so uh, one of the major benefits of the Python target is that you have access to a vast library of Python modules. So um, to, to demonstrate that, I've created one example which um, actually uses a deep neural network, an object detector called YOLO. This is version 5 uh, within Lingo Franco. So you can see the architecture of the program down here, which is very simple. Um, so there is um, a webcam uh, reactor, which is in charge of obtaining frames from my webcam here. Um, there is a DNN module, which uh, contains the DNN itself. And the results of that, um, so this DNN will take frames from the webcam reactor and it will produce labels, object labels based on that frame and also coordinates for that for those object labels. And uh, these two together with the original frame are uh, fed to this plotter, uh, which then will demonstrate uh, the results. Okay, so let me run this for you. Um, I need to disable my uh, webcam so that this application can use it. Um, okay, so... Saving this and executing this. It will take a little bit, but then you might be able to see the results here. Yeah, you can see I strategically put a chair behind me. Um, and you might on the right hand side see some uh, output from this. You can see that it says receive the DNN output late by about, this is about 1.5 seconds but it, it is only for a few frames. So the reason for that, and Edward, uh, I think will explain this later, is if what I did was I put, um, get rid of this, Oops. So I put a deadline of 50 milliseconds on the outputs of the deep neural network. And what has happened here is that at, at least during the startup, uh, that 50 millisecond has not been sufficient. If I make this deadline uh, here, which is um, a parameter, if I change it to 10 milliseconds and run the application again, you will see that I will get a lot more deadline violations here. Uh, generally, I think a conservative deadline for this DNN on my PC is 30 milliseconds. So 10 milliseconds is too small of a deadline. Um, another quick thing to note is that the way uh, this program reads webcam uh, frames is using a physical action. And again, Edward will extensively talk about this, but a physical action inherently is a tool uh, for a lingua franca program to obtain physical events. Um, and what will happen is when this physical action is scheduled, the uh, uh, timestamp is assigned to the events based on the underlying the clock. Um, and uh, what, uh, what is triggering this physical action is a concurrent Python thread that is running in the background and it's constantly calling this read from the camera. Um, and as soon as it is able to obtain a frame, it will call this physical action, which will in turn start uh, the whole pipeline. So this deadline will be relative to uh, approximately where, when a frame was uh, produced. Um, however, you don't have to do that. You can actually drive uh, the webcam reactor with a timer. So I have another example here. Here, instead of a physical action, the frames are actually obtained using a timer. So you can see that there is a timer with a period of 60 milliseconds. And every time that timer ticks, 
um, it will try to read a frame and then produce a frame. Um, and you can see that there is the, this three second offset or in real time systems, what they call phase, because the warm up time for this application is about two something seconds. And if I run this uh, real quick, you will see that I will miss a lot more deadlines. It's just because uh, the, this timer is blocking uh, the program until it can read something. Um, and the likelihood of missing deadlines is quite high now. So there is a trade-off here um, that you might consider. Uh, but with that, that concludes my um, demo. And so back to Edward. Uh, thank you, Sarush. Um, that was that was excellent. Um, so this ability to uh, exploit the ecosystem of Python is a really very powerful thing. And uh, so I'd like to introduce next a, uh, a, a Berkeley student, a senior in our EECS uh, department, uh, Stephen Wong. So Stephen uh, joined the project just, um, I think, two or three weeks ago. And so he, uh, I think, is a kind of good existence proof of the ability to ramp up pretty quickly. Um, and he's going to show us uh, a couple of examples that he has built in the Python target. So Stephen? Hi, uh, let me share my screen first. Hopefully you all can see my screen now. So um, as Edward mentioned, uh, in, and Sarush also uh, in the Python target, um, it has the power to import or utilize packages that are already existing uh, in the Python ecosystem. And that's also one of the main um, strengths of uh, using Python as a programming language. And here I've written a uh, program in Lingua Franca, which utilizes the Pygame package to um, build a piano. So I am currently in the uh, directory of this Lingua Franca program, and I can uh, use LFC, which is the Lingua Franca compiler, to compile my piano program. And Also, uh, because the piano program has sound, I might have to reshare this uh, just to double check. I enable share sound. Yeah, I'm sharing sound now. So if I run this program, a Pi game uh, interface would pop up, but it would take some time because of the library. And after I uh, showed the uh, work a working piano. I can briefly describe how it's achieved in uh, the Lingua Franca program. So. Okay, here's the piano. Are you able to hear it? Nice. So uh, the piano is uh, rather simple. It looks simple. So whenever I press the uh, characters that is labeled here on my keyboard. I can play sound and I can also play black key as well, several keys at the same time, chords. Right. So uh, here's the code for the piano program. Uh, I'll go over the diagram briefly. So um, at the beginning, I first, uh, oops, I first initialized um, the audio system of, of the program. And after the audio system is uh, initialized, it will send signal in this signal to other uh, components of the program and it puts up other uh, reactors and then eventually starts the GUI and then there's a loop of getting user inputs and then translating the keys of my keyboard, like the key presses into uh, musical notes and then it will send uh, requests to update the graphic of the GUI. So, Everything done here is a blocking. So whenever I press a new button, the graphics update. If I don't do anything, uh, 
it's blocking, so it won't take up my much of my CPU. So uh, that's the gist of my uh, demo. Also, um, inside this Linger Franco program, one uh, another thing I could do is I could also include Python files. So I'm currently including another Python file, right? That implements some part of the program. But then the main uh, work of connecting all the components together is uh, built in Linger Franca. And that's my demo. Thank you. Great. Uh, thanks, Stephen. Uh, I'm really personally looking forward to uh, uh, playing with this and using the timing features of Lingua Franca to um, yeah, try to get creative with it. It looks like it'll be a lot of fun. Um, so the next uh, target language that I'd like uh, us to cover is TypeScript, which is a dialect of JavaScript. And you may know that JavaScript is one of the top languages used worldwide, and there's a whole ecosystem around that as well um, that's much more focused on uh, web-integrated uh, computing. So I'd like to turn it over to Martin Lostra, uh, who uh, has been the person primarily in charge of this target. Martin? Um, you're in charge now. Cool. Thank you, Edward. Uh, yeah. Um, so before I continue with the TypeScript target, I wanted to briefly mention something that I had overlooked uh, in my uh, C explanation. So uh, the uh, target properties that were featured in uh, in the code that we've seen so far. Uh, so you can actually uh, add um, information to the target. And one of the commonly used target properties is the timeout. And so you can specify timeout to um, uh, let the program terminate after a set time. Um, I hadn't explained that. Another thing that I also wanted to point out is that we have some pretty neat error handling specifically for the uh, C target where we use uh, line directives in the generated code to figure out where, where problems are. So uh, as I said, uh, you know, uh, very, I was very disciplined about saying, well, you know, this reaction, it uh, creates an output. So I have to declare that, but you know, what if I'm forgetful and, and I don't, so let's remove that. And then we see that you actually get um, an error here, a compilation error, because uh, the uh, out variable was not brought into scope. This is really critical to, um, you know, uh, having, um, you know, accurate descriptions of what the components can do. And that's what our runtime uses in order to be able to safely exploit parallelism and, and, and so forth. Okay, so that was just an aside. Um, so moving on, uh, let's go and create another Lingua Franca project, uh, which is, um, let's call it example two. Uh, let's uh, create a, a web server. So this is, um, an example written in TypeScript. And just as Python, you know, opens up to a wealth of existing software and packages that you can use, uh, so does uh, Node.js, and uh, that's what we're using. Um, TypeScript can compile down to JavaScript and that can be run using Node. Um, so that makes it also very easy to build a little web server. Um, so <clears throat> the, um, the idea is very simple. So we have, um, let me make this slightly smaller so that, oh, I'm getting that again. Um, so we have one reactor. Uh, it has a, uh, a state, which is just really um, a, a node module called HTTP that runs in the background. Um, and then uh, it has a physical action, uh, which allows a reaction here to be triggered uh, uh, asynchronously. So whenever a response, uh, whenever a request comes in from somebody that is, you know, trying to reach this website, uh, a physical action um, gets uh, gets triggered, um, or, or, or yeah, becomes active and then triggers this reaction, and that will formulate the response and pipe that pipes that back into this uh, this um, uh, web server uh, object that was created. Um, so we can quickly have a look at what. Um, what that looks like. So um, these TypeScript um, um, programs are actually created as if uh, they were, um, let me, uh, yes, 
quick. So if you look in the uh, SRC gen uh, folder, that's where the um, TypeScript code gets put. So let's look at this with code. If it's willing to do that, I guess it's not. So the idea is that whatever you create with the Lingua Franca program is that uh, you can publish it using NPM. Uh, so you'll see here in SOC gen that there is a package.json uh, with some dependencies and uh, you can also uh, edit those and you can add modules that you want to use. And then our uh, compiler will uh, automatically pull in those dependency, uh, dependencies and use them. Um, so if we, So if we now want to run this, we can just uh, invoke node. So uh, in the src gen directory, uh, there is a dist directory um, and that has a plain JavaScript code, uh, plain JavaScript um, a file that um, um, you can invoke using node. So let's do that. And that shows me that there's a web server running at uh, port 8000. And so, Let's open a browser window and see how that works. And it does. So now this is not a very fancy demo, but of course this, um, you know, clearly shows, uh, you know, the uh, extensibility, the, 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 the advantage of being able to use all of these node modules. And um, it would be uh, pretty straightforward to, to build some nice web applications out of this. Uh, and also to use it as a, a user interface component that could be a front end of perhaps a you know, deeply embedded system or something like that. Um, so I think that we're a little uh, late. So let's not look at the um, um, uh, generated code. I just wanted to mention two things. Uh, first of all, I've gotten help building this uh, initially uh, from um, uh, Andres Huns, uh, later um, Matt Weber um, contributed uh, to the, uh, the TypeScript runtime. And now also uh, Hoken Kim is actively involved in uh, maintaining this. And um, um, the other thing is, um, I don't know, I forget. <laughs> I think that was it. <laughs> Back to you, Edward. Okay, good. Uh, thank you, Martin. Again, Martin is a postdoc at Berkeley. Um, so um, the languages that you've seen so far, uh, C is, of course, the least safe of all. Um, C++ uh, allows you using, for example, these smart pointers to be a little bit uh, safer. Uh, TypeScript, of course, has both the, the stronger type system of the TypeScript extension of uh, JavaScript, which is an important thing, and also, you know, this kind of web programming ecosystem uh, and the ability to use uh, kind of security features. Um, the most interesting, from my perspective, recently developed language is one that um, kind of shares the efficiency of C, but with really very modern safety uh, concepts in mind, which is Rust. So I'd like to introduce uh, Clément uh, Fournier, who is a student at the Technical University of Dresden. Uh, he's been working also um, with Jeronimo Castrillon's uh, group in the uh, compiler construction chair. And so um, take it away, Clément. Thank you, Edward. I'm going to share my screen. All right. So, yeah. So, for those of you who are unfamiliar with uh, the Rust programming language, it's basically um, a systems programming language. So, it's low level enough to do some um, to program in um, embedded systems. It supports things like direct memory access, pointer arithmetic, um, and uh, most importantly, it has no runtime GC. 
but it still uh, provides strong guarantees about the memory safety of uh, Rust programs. For instance, um, well, so it uses its type system, which uses an ownership system to uh, track the lifetime of every value and to present to um, uh, guarantee, for instance, that all references actually uh, point to valid data. So that prevents uh, use after free bugs where you access garbage through a pointer, which is a kind of a common bug in C and C++ programs. Um, so this safety is a big, um, uh, like a bit of advantage of Rust, uh, also because it's asserted at compile time. Um, another attractive feature of Rust is that it has uh, also a big ecosystem of libraries and also uh, good support by different tools and IDEs. And with that in mind, well, that's why uh, we want to support the Rust target. So the support for the Rust target is still very much experimental, but um, I'd like to show you a small example program, uh, which is, uh, well, it's a demo level program. So it's a snake game. So it's a terminal game where um, the rendering logic is just building a string that represents uh, the board game and the snake and uh, just doing that at repeated intervals. So the interval at which this is done um, uh, shrinks as uh, when the, the game um, well becomes more difficult. So the more I eat food with the snake, uh, the faster it gets. And this is all implemented using uh, Lingua Franca's, well, by relying on Lingua Franca's semantics uh, for uh, timed events. So uh, we actually, so this kind of uh, rendering loop is actually implemented with uh, Lingua Franca primitives. So we're gonna look now at the implementation of this. So here I have the program opened in Epoch. So it fits into three source files. We have a main source file, snake.lf, where the main logic of our application is uh, in there. So it's pretty short. Uh, each reaction is pretty well short and to the point. We have a keyboard events uh, reactor, which is uh, whose main purpose is just to handle asynchronous keyboard events. And a snakes.rs uh, file, which is a pure Rust file and which implements our model classes and basically the business logic uh, of our application. So it's also pretty short, but uh, yeah, the, the main point of showing you this is that a part of the program can be written in pure Rust and be linked uh, seamlessly within this LF program. Um, another thing that is interesting is that we can actually use the LF, uh, well, the cargo uh, tool, which is the build tool for Rust uh, packages. It's also a package manager. And so we can add dependencies on uh, uh, crates, which are modules like in the Rust uh, terminology. So we can add dependencies on external libraries, which in this particular example allow us to like uh, handle uh, keyboard events uh, for our snake example. Yeah. So another interesting thing uh, which we can see here is that the main reactor also can take parameters. So this is similar to C++, um, um, to the C++ feature. So you can also mention these parameters on the command line. We have uh, automatic uh, help generation, like, if I do that, we also have like these uh, uh, parameters here. So this is just a nice feature. So about the design um, uh, maybe of this uh, application, we have this uh, diagram, which helps us uh, grasp uh, how everything is uh, relates to, I mean, is interconnected. So we have our main um, uh, snake reactor and within the keyboard events uh, instance, um, uh, yeah, to which, and every time a keyboard, uh, an arrow, uh, yeah, Every time a key is pressed, then uh, it emits an event here, which is handled by the snake reactor. Here we can see the actual loop, which I was referring to earlier. So this is the refresh loop, um, which uh, executes, well, each iter iteration um, is uh, uh, spaced with a delay that shrinks as uh, uh, when the game speeds up. And every time uh, the loop, uh, I mean, on every iteration, this refresh, refresh screen reaction is called. So taking a look at this. Uh, so this is actually generated into a Rust function um, with uh, parameters uh, that correspond to the dependencies that are injected. So if you don't declare a dependency, you can't access it at all. You don't even have a reference to it. Um, and the self here, so Rust is also kind of object oriented. Um, and so the self keyword actually means uh, it's like the this pointer in, in, in C++. So we can access the state variables that are declared on our reactor like this. Um, so here we have, uh, yeah, we access the snake uh, state variable and also the grid. And this is like the main function uh, which implements uh, like the stepping forward of the snake and computes the result. Um, and then we can use uh, pattern matching, which is also a kind of high level feature of Rust, which makes it very nice to program with. 
and uh, we can uh, execute a, a different action depending on the result of this function. So for instance, if the move uh, that the snake took was illegal, like the snake bit its tail basically, um, then the function will return game over and then we can uh, request that the application be stopped. So this reads quite nicely, uh, like context request stop ASAP. Um, the context here is an object that, that is uh, implicitly injected, um, um, like in addition to all the, the, um, the dependencies here. And it's basically the object with which um, um, every reaction interacts with the scheduler. Um, and so here we ask that it requests um, stopping the application. We could also tell it to uh, stop the application after a short delay, like two seconds, just the time, for instance, to print a message or something. And for this, we can use uh, this syntax, which is uh, a call to a Rust macro. Um, so this is um, this uh, Rust macro passes this string at compile time and expands it to um, a uh, to the Rust uh, expression that would actually create a duration object, uh, which represents a two second delay. So this is pretty nice, yeah, the Rust macro system. So yeah, diving maybe into this keyboard events reactor, we see here how we handle keyboard events. So on the startup event, we actually will spawn um, an asynchronous thread, which will uh, block waiting for um, your input events. But since it runs in the background, uh, it doesn't interrupt the main thread and like the main event loop. And every time uh, a key is pressed, then we're gonna, uh, again, use pattern matching to identify the arrow keys. And if the key was an arrow key, then we actually will, well, um, we'll send it back to our logical, um, um, like, yeah, to our logical synchronous uh, event system, which will process it deterministically using the reactions we saw in the other reactor. Um, and what's interesting here and what uh, is that this is an example, I mean, we can use this as an example of uh, the safety that the REST type system buys us since, um, well, this thread is actually ha has a type which isn't seen here because REST has uh, an elaborate type inference. But the type of this thread actually forbids the thread from taking references um, to, for instance, the context, because um, the context, I mean, the context object will actually die, uh, be destroyed before the thread um, is actually destroyed itself. So if we take a reference to it like this, um, at some point, the reference will become garbage. And this is disallowed by the compiler. So if I actually write this and try to compile it, I'll get a compiler um, uh, of the Rust compiler. So this is also nice because uh, capturing a reference to the context and uh, uh, putting it in a background thread and invoking methods on it asynchronously would basically completely break uh, the semantics of our um, reactor program. So yeah, we can use the type system of Rust to actually guarantee that we don't do um, uh, silly things like that. Um, yeah, I, I think my time is up. So uh, I'm gonna pass uh, Mike back to, to Edward, thanks. Okay, uh, Clement, uh, thanks very much. So that was a sort of quick overview of the various target languages. It emphasizes that, uh, that Lingua Franca is a polyglot um, programming framework and a coordination language rather than a programming language. It's not meant to replace your programming languages. Um, currently, you cannot mix the languages in the same application, uh, but we have done some experimentation with um, multilingual programs and um, we know it is possible in certain circumstances to combine these languages. Uh, it's, so that's an ongoing effort to uh, develop that capability. So let's take a five minute break now. Um, and I guess we will be available for Q&A, but I'm gonna pause the recording.